I am very happy to have this opportunity to remind you about how to use energy or water or materials with radically greater efficiency by asking different design questions in a different order. I won't be talking today about energy supply. Uh, modern renewables now provide two-thirds of the world's net additions of electric capacity uh, thanks to their powerful business case. Our bigger challenge is capturing modern megawatts, saved watts. Saved energy is already the world's biggest energy source. It's bigger than oil. Each year, it quietly decarbonizes the global economy twice as much as renewable growth does. Guess which one gets most of the headlines and most of the space on this conferences and all conferences programs. And yet, we are exploiting only a tiny fraction of efficiency's growing potential. Around 1975, our government and industry all said the energy needed to make a dollar of GDP could never go down. A year later, I heretically suggested it could drop 72% in 50 years. So far, it's dropped 58% in 43 years. But just the innovations already added by 2010 can save another threefold, twice what I originally thought, at a third the real cost. And today that's looking conservative because integrative design, that is optimizing buildings, vehicles, and factories as whole systems, not as piles of parts, can often make very big energy savings cost less than small or no savings, turning diminishing returns into increasing returns. Professor Allwood's group at Cambridge University says global energy use 14 years ago was only about a ninth as efficient as physics allows. So including passive options too, they concluded that 85% of energy demand could be practically avoided using current knowledge and available technologies. I think that's a bit conservative, but whatever the right number is, we now know how to get a lot closer and much cheaper. Economic geologists know that the reserves of a mineral, the identified deposits profitably extractable at today's technology and price, are only a small part of the whole resource base. And most energy analysts also narrowly define reserves of energy efficiency, like the bright green zone in these mineral resource definitions, and leave out the rest. But the actual energy efficiency reserves are several fold larger than are now typically recognized and captured. And the missing majority is hiding in plain view, exploitable by integrative design. But this geological analogy, which works for quantity, breaks down on costs. Ore bodies or oil reservoirs are finite assemblages of depletable atoms. But energy efficiency resources are infinitely expandable assemblages of ideas, depleting only stupidity, a very abundant resource. <clears throat> That's documented in an 11-month-old peer-reviewed paper called How Big is the Energy Efficiency Resource? Uh, you can find it just by searching on that title. And even if you don't read the whole paper, I think you'll enjoy the four-minute video abstract. It's evidence across all sectors shows that unlike oil or copper, most new energy efficiency reserves cost less than the savings we're getting now because they don't come from adding more or fancier widgets. Instead, they come from using fewer and simpler widgets, more artfully chosen, combined, timed, and sequenced. So how do we do this magic? Well, before jumping right into that, let's start with a little metal calisthenic. One of my early mentors, the inventor Edwin Land, said, don't undertake a project unless it is manifestly important and nearly impossible. <laughs> he also said, people who seem to have had a new idea have often just stopped having an old idea. That's the hard part. <clears throat> An Asian tradition similarly urges us to seek original's mind, uh, beginner's mind, child mind, opening ourselves to new ideas by shedding all assumptions and preconceptions. So in that spirit, here's an example from Caltech's late great aerodynamicist, Paul McCready. Uh, just looking for a, here's a laser. Uh, <clears throat> for decades, textbooks on creative thinking uh, have uh, posed this problem as find the solution 
that connects these nine dots with just four lines without lifting your pen from the paper. And you're supposed to think one, two, three, four, oops, five. Hmm. One, two, that isn't going to work. And what you're supposed to do is think outside the box, which is where that expression comes from. But one day a student startled her professor by saying she'd solved this problem with just three lines. Gee, four was hard enough. How do you do it with three? You know, dots are infinitely small. Well, actually, these are kind of plump dots, and it looks like you don't have to go through the center of them, so if your paper's wide enough, you can do this Z for Zorro trick. <laughs> and seeing this, the students started to feel rather liberated. You know what happens then? They started to solve this problem in one line. I'll just start you off with a few of their many solutions. If you're a Japanese, you might think of the origami solution. Uh, or if you're a geographer, you might use a very long line. <clears throat> or if you're a mechanical engineer, a tool-using critter, you might take a tool called a scissors. There's no rule against cutting out the dots and impaling them. Uh, or if, if you're a statistician, you might realize you can crumple up the paper, and if you stab it over and over again with a pencil enough times, eventually you'll go through all nine dots at the same moment. The solution I like best came from a nine-year-old girl who said, you didn't say it had to be a thin line, so I used a, a really thick line. <laughs> so as Paul McCready said, this tyranny of the word the, find the solution with four lines, puts us back in the box and keeps us from being more creative in coming up with more elegantly frugal solutions. So with beginner's mind, never having built a house before, therefore not knowing what was impossible, uh, 37 years ago I did the conceptual and energy design, and Steve Conger, who spoke earlier, did the architecture uh, of this owner-builder house where Judy and I live 7,100 feet up near Aspen, actually in Old Snowmass, just over the ridge. Temperatures here used to drop as low as minus 47F. We've seen as much as 39 days of continuous midwinter cloud, and yet we have no heating system. And emitting the heating system subtracted slightly more construction cost than was added by the super insulation and super windows and ventilation heat recovery that eliminated the heating system. This house helped inspire the German and then European passive house movement. The central atrium seen here in a February snowstorm is currently fruiting, let's see, the 76th banana crop, uh, papayas, babacos, pineapple, guavas, coffee, and uh, limes. Uh, <clears throat> and an analogous approach also turned out to work fine in Bangkok. Nearly everyone on Earth li lives in climates somewhere between Bangkok and Old Snowmass. Integrative design gives many benefits from each expenditure, so this white arch has 12 different functions, but it has only one cost. Now, in the opposite climate, 16 million square feet of offices use up to 80% less energy than the norm in six muggy Indian cities. They cost 10 or 20% less to build, and yet they give superior comfort and satisfaction. Their free lighting is delivered throughout by contract. If any worker complains and wants blinds, the architect doesn't get paid. And it works in retrofitting old buildings. Our Empire State Building retrofit remanufactured all 6,514 windows on site into super windows that pass light through but block heat. And that plus better lights and office equipment and so on cut the maximum cooling load by a third. So then renovating smaller chillers instead of adding bigger chillers saved 17 odd million dollars of capital cost, paying for most of those improvements and cutting the payback to three years or less than one year if we'd counted the non-energy benefits to the owner or the tenants. A big energy service company had also offered a three-year payback, but with disintegrated design that saved only a sixth as much energy, so they didn't get the job. Now, integrative design is evolving swiftly. That Empire State Building retrofit saved 38% of the energy with a three-year payback, the energy intensity is in green. And three years later, our cost-effective Denver retrofit of the Byron Rogers Center saved 70% making that half-century-old federal complex more efficient than what was then the best new U.S. office at NREL, which in turn is less than half as efficient as our own passive net positive no mechanicals office down the road of Basalt. And now there's a Bavarian building 
uh, said to use three-fifths less energy than ours. I gotta see how they could do that. And yet, these technologies all existed over a decade ago. What mainly improved doubling the best efficiencies in five years is not so much technology as design, the way we choose and combine technologies. The <clears throat> Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change five years ago reported that for diverse building types and climates, the best European new buildings on the left and retrofits on the right, but both with bigger savings toward the right, uh, are saving up to at least 90% of their energy without costing more per unit of saved energy. The better projects are all highly cost effective. The big vertical cost scatter just shows the business opportunity from conforming inferior projects to best practices, because whatever exists is possible. Timing matters too. When retrofitting a big glass office tower, <coughs> Super windows plus efficient lights and equipment can shrink mechanical loads and systems by fourfold, more than paying up front for the efficiencies that track them. So a fourfold efficiency gain in this old Chicago building could thus pay back in about minus five months. In other words, it's cheaper than the routine 20 year renovation that saves nothing. If you coordinate that deep retrofit with routine renewal of the curtain wall facade, which you have to do about every 20 years anyway. Deep retrofits of all our big buildings is gonna take several decades, so let's right time them to make the savings a lot bigger and cheaper. Similar design logic <coughs> applies to automobiles. The propulsion system, or powertrain, loses four-fifths of the fuel energy in round numbers before it reaches the wheels. But our savings should start at the wheels. Here's why. Just a fifth of a modern car's fuel energy reaches the wheels and moves the car. Of that so-called tractive load, nearly half heats the air that the car pushes aside, most of the rest heats the tires and road, and then only the last 6% of the fuel energy accelerates the car and then heats the brakes when you stop. Oh, it gets worse, 19 twentieths of the mass you're accelerating is not you, it's the heavy steel car. So just a 20th of that 6%, or about 0.3% of the fuel energy ultimately moves the driver. This is not very gratifying after one and a third centuries of devoted engineering effort. <laughs> Moreover, both acceleration and rolling resistance depend on mass, which therefore causes most of the tractive load. So automakers work very hard to cut losses in the powertrain because that's where most of the losses are. It's like somebody asked Willie Sutton, why do you rob banks? He said, because that's where the money is. Uh, but reducing powertrain losses is harder than reducing tractive load because there's been so much work done on it already. And <clears throat> it's also much less rewarding because saving one unit of energy in the powertrain saves only one unit of fuel at the tank. But saving one unit of energy at the wheels saves four or five more units that get lost getting the energy to the wheels and therefore leverages five or six units of total energy saved at the tank. So that's why we should first reduce tractive load by making the car especially lighter and more slippery and then improve the powertrain and then the powertrain gets smaller for the same acceleration. That saves more weight and it saves capital costs to help pay for the light weighting. Just like in my house, getting rid of the heating system, paid for the stuff that got rid of the heating system. Okay, now 19 years ago, we designed such an ultralight <coughs> carbon fiber electrified hypercar, this four to six fold more efficient midsize SUV. Seven years later, using design methods we shared, <coughs> Toyota <coughs> designed a carbon fiber plug-in hybrid sedan that was 70% lighter than a Prius of the same interior volume. Carbon fiber electric cars entered mass production in 2013 with this profitable 124 mile a gallon Model I drive, more on that in a minute. Even with conventional materials, fleet vans like this one ton lighter aluminum hybrid we developed and road tested a decade ago could save about a fifth of US uh, auto fuel and need no subsidy. But with carbon fiber structures, <coughs> today's <coughs> excuse me, fastest manufacturing processes like one we developed and sold into the supply chain that can make a complex two by two meter comp carbon fiber part in one minute can now make carbon fiber 
electric cars at normal cost. Why do we know that? Well, because BMW did it starting six years ago with this carbon fiber electric car I drive, and this I-3 reportedly made money from the first unit off the assembly line. The normally understated Dean of Automotive Costing in Detroit, Sandy Monroe, called it the most significant vehicle since the Model T and the most advanced vehicle on the planet. Validating claims we've been making in the 90s, its carbon fiber is paid for by needing fewer batteries to haul less weight around and fewer batteries recharge faster. The integrative design decompounds mass. It snowballs weight savings far more than usually assumed. Its manufacturing is radically frugal. It confirms the elimination of the conventional body and paint shops, the two hardest and costliest steps in making a car, and it's much better for workers. And overlooked synergies between ultralight materials and electric traction quadruple its efficiency without compromise and with many driver advantages. <coughs> okay, so now let's try an eye chart. <coughs> Designing whole cars can make them several fold more efficient, more cheaply than is officially acknowledged. With extra sticker price on the vertical axis and rated miles per gallon fuel efficiency on the horizontal axis, the official technology by technology analytic method that underlies policy in the US and worldwide yielded these National Research Council high and low supply curves of how much you pay for how much efficiency uh, in cars and light trucks, about 15 years ahead. Then they updated in 2015 and caught up with some previously rejected independent analyses. But those official forecasts were soon embarrassed by actual market forecast, uh, actual market platforms like uh, this from Honda, from Toyota, a hybrid, from BMW, an electric vehicle. Uh, <clears throat> and by major automakers, light metal gasoline engine virtual design in collaboration with RMI, and also by a Porsche engineering virtual design using high strength steel, and then our estimate of what it would look like as a hybrid up toward the right. Uh, <clears throat> in 2004, we adapted the base vehicles in our winning the oil endgame analysis based on our 2000 Revolution SUV design and got some typical uh, light truck and light car uh, equivalents. And, uh, and then here's the aluminum commercial fleet van. So <clears throat> you notice that the component-based official analyses, the curves at the left, misses the entire right-hand two-thirds or more of the design space. You can only discover that by designing whole vehicles, not by counting one part at a time. Uh, and therefore, you can at least triple and at lower cost the fuel savings that policymakers now expect. Uh, <clears throat> if you analyze auto efficiency by the part, not by the car, efficiency looks several fold smaller and costlier than you can actually achieve by designing whole vehicles. So, current efficiency standards are much more conservative than anyone thought, and electrification, or for that matter, hydrogen. Uh, fuel cell propulsion can be a lot cheaper and faster than today's heavy platforms are yet exploiting. End of eye chart. What about industry, <clears throat> which uses half the world's energy and electricity? Well, my team's latest 40-odd, probably by now 50-odd billion dollars worth of <clears throat> industrial integrated designs typically found energy savings around 30 to 60 percent, paying back in a few years, and in new factories, 40 to 90 odd percent savings with generally lower capital cost. So we did a lot better than the upper brown retrofit zone where most energy service companies deliver disintegrated design. Our better results come from rethinking industrial processes and from redesigning basic elements like fan pump and motor systems. For example, in both buildings and industry, better pipe and duct design can save about 80 or 90 percent of the friction. And if everyone did it, this could save, in principle, about half the world's coal-fired electricity, typically paying back in less than a year in industrial retrofits and instantly in new builds. The methods are simple. Use big pipes and small pumps, not small pipes and big pumps, and lay out the pipes first, then the equipment. 
But such rearrangement of designer's metal furniture remains largely unnoticed and unpracticed. It's not in any but one engineering text or any industry uh, analysis or government forecast or climate model. Why not? Because it's not a technology. It's a design method. And few people yet think of design as a way to scale up savings quickly. We just need to learn to bend minds, not pipes. In California's Oakland Museum, for example, our colleague Peter Rumsey retrofitted an efficient piping layout, rather odd looking, ugly is beautiful, uh, <clears throat> into the condenser water pumping loop. That cut the pumping energy by three fourths, paid back in two or three months, and eliminated 15 pumps that will never again waste energy and maintenance costs. When he then repiped the museum's chilled water loop the same way and added variable frequency drives, he doubled the flow and saved 85% of the energy. He just asked the pipe fitters to lay out the supply pipes as if they were drains. <laughs> Anybody knows if you put an elbow in a drain, it'll clog. What do such savings mean for the pumps and fans that use half the torque of the motors that use over half the world's electricity? Well, from the fuel burned at the power plant to the end use, there are so many losses compounding that only a tenth of the original fuel energy comes out the pipe as flow. But now those turn those compounding losses around backwards from right to left, they become compounding savings, and every unit of flow or friction you save in the pipe saves 10 units of fuel cost pollution and what Hunter Lovins calls global weirding back at the power plant. And as you go back upstream, the components get smaller and cheaper, so the total capital cost goes down. If a tenfold pumping saving sounds to you incredible, just consider that at this moment your heart is pumping blood about 10 times as efficiently as typical industrial pumping systems move liquids. If your 60,000 miles of fractal blood vessels had the design and friction of standard industrial piping, you would need a heart bigger than your body. This would be very inconvenient. Uh, but. In fact, your roughly 12 ounce, one and a half watt heart suffices because your blood flow follows nature's standard design, which is laminar vortex flow, and that's now being exploited to make pumps and fans about 20 or 30 percent more efficient. Similar logic to what I've described for all these other systems applies to, say, big data centers. Two thirds of the fuel we feed into the power plant is lost in the plant and the grid. Uh, half the metered electricity is then lost in the cooling system and the uninterruptible power supplies, which together make up half the capital cost of the data center, before it gets to the servers, and then half the server energy doesn't get to the chips because it's lost in inefficient, usually very underloaded power supplies, and in a lot of fans to take heat that largely shouldn't be there off the motherboard into the room so we can do dumb things with it. Then the next problem is severe underutilization of computing resources, partly through not enough virtualization. And the resulting energy flow is so small, it's about to vanish, so let's magnify it uh, <clears throat> before we lose it. And then next problem is bloatware running m many unnecessary threads and processes and making simple tasks very complicated because uh, compute cycles were cheaper than programmers' attention and somebody else was paying for the electricity. Then downstream of, of all that, you might even have inefficient business processes. So in all, a few hundred thousandth of the original uh, energy in the power plant fuel ends up producing customer value. So where should we start fixing this? Downstream, start at the end, first write elegantly terse code optimally compiled with the goal that every compute cycle is a needed and wanted one. I'd assume this could save roughly tenfold uh, in compute cycles, but recent tests suggest this a hundredfold. Uh, and the shift to mobile devices now makes this valuable again because it means battery life. I understand there's some good news coming in uh, server operating systems. Now, then we can at least quadruple the server efficiency, now even more than that. And then the servers will need a lot less cooling and power supply, both of which can be done in smarter ways. And we could even save half the utility losses by using fuel cell trigeneration cheaper than the uninterruptible power supply it displaces. So multiply all those savings from downstream to upstream, and you get on the order of a hundredfold, maybe a thousandfold 
potential energy savings. Now, in the actual installation, oh, let's see, well over a decade ago, uh, for which we made this diagram, the client rejected most of our recommendations, so we were only able to triple efficiency at the same capital cost, uh, which is pretty disappointing. However, our partner EDS said that had our recommendations they agreed with, which is about all of them, all been adopted, we would have saved about 95% of the energy and half the capital cost without yet doing anything to the software. Now, in industry, we're starting to switch fossil fuel burning industrial processes over to electricity, and heat pumps can now make heat many fold more efficiently at up to 160 C. Some are pushing over 100 C. But it's at least as interesting to look for the many processes that need low temperatures or low temperature differences, and yet that now use fossil fueled boilers and furnaces. So, this miniature 200,000 RPM sort of fist size domestic hot water heat pump beat 60% of the theoretical maximum efficiency called Carnot efficiency by optimizing for the small temperature rise that's actually required. And then at the Tesla all-electric, all-photovoltaic battery gigafactory out in the Nevada desert, J.B. Straubel's first design decision was that it would have no gas pipe. And his colleagues said, J.B., you must be nuts. We're going to need process heat. Everybody knows you do that with gas because it's cheapest. But he then came back with the air permit in a half hour over the counter transaction because he wasn't burning anything. Normally that's a six month approval process if it's uncontested. What is six to 12 months worth in the battery business? And then going all electric drove serious innovation. Their biggest process load was redistilling a vital solvent and normally that's done with a thermal megawatt of gas boilers which he cut down to a 15 kilowatt electric heat pump that would fit under one of these tables. Why? Because it only needed a one and a half Kelvin temperature difference, so it allowed near Carnot efficiency, a 98 and a half percent energy savings. Surprisingly, many process heat loads are like that. But again, the most powerful interventions come not from finding a better widget, but from starting with beginner's mind and asking a different design question. For example, there was a new environmental manager at Safeway who was asked to figure out what to do with that nasty fatty waste left over from cleaning out pipes in their ice cream factory. And uh, <clears throat> he said one day, gee, why are we making in batches, stopping between each batch and the next and cleaning out everything and throwing it away when we could just keep track of the mixed zone that's transitioned from this flavor to that flavor as it goes through the pipes and then we'll package it separately and sell it as you know, magical mystery tour, mixed <laughs> flavor. We don't know what it is either, but everyone's different and you'll like it. So they tried that and look what it does. Uh, you save, uh, well, you earn your average product margin. You don't waste material cleaning out the pipes. You don't have to dispose of it either. You don't waste time and materials cleaning it out. You get more production at no investment from the freed up capacity. Uh, and by the way, they could sell it for a premium. <laughs> and they think it cannibalized their competitors' products more than their own because nobody else had anything like this. Uh, so is that yummy or what? Uh, there was a second case. I was able to find some substantial conventional improvements in a nearly new high arctic diamond mine, industrial diamonds. But then one day I got curious about gray tonnage distribution, asked him to look at the curve. And then I asked, so how do you assay how much diamond is in a chunk of kimberlite. And this revealed a rather promising uh, alternative that would eliminate the mine and the mill, cost a lot less, and give better recovery uh, of the resource, especially if any big diamonds were there, because otherwise they'd probably get broken before you knew that they were there. So to see that, you had to know, how do they assay diamonds? Well, you dissolve the kimberlite in hot caustic soda, uh, and only diamonds remain. So how about we make a sandworm like, like in uh, the uh, Herbert uh, Dune novels, sci-fi, and it has hot caustic in its gut. It chews its way down and around in the kimberlite carrot-shaped formation, and it poops out diamonds, and then you, you uh, come along after and neutralize. Uh, now the sandworm's going to need really fancy metallurgy because, or some material because 
hot caustic is very nasty stuff, but even if you had to make it out of pure unobtainium, costing orders of magnitude more than conventional metals, it would still be a lot cheaper than what they're doing now. Uh, even, and, and in fact, the head of the operation said, this is such a good idea, I'm prepared to abandon everything you see here and switch over even though we're a third of the way through the mining plan. Unfortunately, uh, that guy that actually did have beginner's mind got hired away a few months later, so it never happened, but still a good idea. Uh, then there was a third case where our team found that 108 kinds of retrofits to the world's largest platinum mine, a kilometer under South Africa, and 43% of them needing no investment, could save over two terawatt hours a year, over five million liters of diesel a year, a couple of megatons a year of CO2. But we found that the highest leverage interventions were not the obvious ones with the mining equipment and process, but were about the miners. And the mentality there had been, well, we satisfied the South African industrial hygiene code, so everything's fine. But it turned out you could do a lot better. Uh, miners had this heavy lead acid battery on their belt and a thumb thick cable connected to an incandescent lamp, good Victorian stuff. So we introduced, you know, lithium battery, LED, caving lights and mountaineering lights. Uh, they were really hot. It was a sauna down there. So we introduced phase change vests, cool the miners, not the air. Uh, take, took care not to release unnecessary humidity down there. Uh, you couldn't see what you were doing because there were strings of incandescent lights making more heat and you could either look at the lights or look at the black wall. Either way, you couldn't see anything. So we suggested painting the walls white and lighting them indirectly. Uh, the workers got hydration at their mid-shift break and then they would drink sweetened tea, a diuretic. They got no electrolytes. They got no continuous hydration. So we introduced some physiological ideas and camelbacks uh, and various other things to calm the working conditions uh, and keep the people cool and, and happy. And, uh, and then just some engineering changes to provide different attributes differently and not release uh, bad air pollution underground with diesels. Don't try to blow tens of thousands of ton chillers uh, cold air down a kilometer sideways several kilometers to cool the miners, but, but rather take heat out with heat pipes that don't take up much space in the precious vertical shaft area and keep the miners cool with the phase change vests and actually get information to the miners so they'd know what they were mining by giving them miniature assay equipment and, and then pay them not for tons hoisted up, tons of what you might ask, old timbers, dead donkeys, country rock, whatever, but just for tons of ore since that's what you want and then you could see whether it's ore before you mine it. So these are, again, different design questions which had not been asked. It was an excellent company, but they were focused on the engineering, not on the fundamentals of what was happening at the face, and I think that's now changed. There was a different mine for iron up a West African mountain and later offered a different opportunity. Living around here, you notice those Austrian ski lifts. We wondered if they could be equipped with buckets, not seats, and run backwards to lower the heavy iron ore down to the port and get electricity back. Sure enough, 92, 93% efficient, it's, it's in the catalog. <laughs> so we could then make even more electricity by running a perched water table that was a nuisance at the mine down to the dry port, selling the water, getting electricity along the way. And together, even without solar power, you could run an, a very efficient all-electric mine this way with no fossil fuels, no emissions, no grid connection. It turned out to be attractive to resupply by the ski lift going back up and dirigible, more beginner's mind. Didn't get done, but still a good idea. Now, I want to end with uh, another kind of efficiency. Industrial energy is dominated by process heat to make basic materials like cement, steel, aluminum. So the products and processes are now being redesigned to use less heat, cooler heat, cleaner heat. But we ought to start at the end with demand not for energy to run the process, but for the materials we're making. In other words, need less, use other, use less, use longer, use again, align incentives. Now, 20 years ago, I had a business book with Paul Hawken called Natural Capitalism and found that U.S. materials flow around 1990 was 99.99% pure waste. So here's how we're starting to think about this opportunity using mainly cement and steel examples around process heat. 
So first we can change how we deliver the services that now need energy intensive materials. For example, the remote infrastructure that delivers six kinds of services to buildings and the wires and pipes in between can often be replaced by on-site technologies at lower cost to society, probably to the developer, saving steel, concrete, and plastics. Also, replacing separate specialized buildings with multi-purpose flexible buildings and multi-use zoning can save both building space and travel. 3D printing enables beautiful uh, bone-like structures using no factory and little metal. A chemical plant may use 80 or 90 percent of its capacity and energy to separate unwanted byproducts, but microreactors etched into stacks of silicon wafers can often control the reaction so precisely that they make only pure product and don't need separating. Both these innovations also allow local manufacturing. That displaces steel vehicles and concrete and steel roads and warehouses. Shared and connected mobility, likewise, saves roads and parking. So does virtual mobility that moves just the electrons and leave the heavy nuclei at home. I'll be giving a speech tonight in Beijing, for example. No air, uh, 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 jet fuel. And designing cities around people, not cars, saves a third of concrete and two-thirds of driving while greatly improving quality of life. Just like mobility as a service, which now has 50 million drivers serving a billion ride hailers, natural capitalism's solutions economy business model can lease structural performance rather than selling tons of cement to deliver it. So the provider and the customer both make more money by using fewer tons. The provider can also reward the structural and civil engineers for delivering the best performance with the least material. I suggested this to the chairman of a giant cement company over dinner a few years ago. He said, good idea. I have 200 people working on that business model right now. I got to go see how they're doing. Rewarding elegantly frugal design can often wring an order of magnitude more work from materials. For example, substituting tension for compression structures typically gives better strength and aesthetics and cost with about an eighth as many tons. The optimal shapes of fabric forms, putting concrete where you want it, not where you don't, can save upwards of half the concrete in beams and sheets and other common shapes to deliver the same or better strength and stiffness. And then the weight saving snowball because you need less strength to hold up less weight. The overall saving in making all kinds of buildings from concrete and steel is upwards of twofold. Nature is rich in incredibly mass efficient designs that we can imitate from trees to bird bones. MIT has self-assembling hooked together miniature lattice structures molded from conventional thermoplastics but over 90% air. They're as strong as stiff as solid elastomers but as light as aerogel. Carbon fiber lattices and carbon nanotube structures can then save another 10 or 100 fold. And now we can make nanotubes from sugar, water, and sunlight by the bacterial enzymes that hummingbirds use to weave their nests. Those lattice structures just produced an airplane wing, MIT, NASA, 59 times less dense than normal and aerodynamically self-optimizing self every little bit automatically tilts to be just the right angle all the time like a bird wing, opening revolutionary prospects for light weighting and aerodynamics and cost reduction. 3D printing of materials frugal bridges, look at that incredibly airy structure, is becoming popular now in China, Holland, Dubai, and elsewhere. Here's a swooping 3D stainless steel bridge, 3D printed, about to span a famous Amsterdam canal. Here the structural engineering faculty at the Technical University of Berlin is testing a 13 meter free span supported by three little carbon fiber ribbons one millimeter thick. We can also substitute low or even negative carbon materials like wood and bamboo for steel and concrete. The cheap husk of the rainforest restoring Indonesian sugar palm has lignin fibers with a tensile strength like stainless steel but a seventh the density. Modern materials are, are powerful too. A thin sheet of carbon fiber composite can save two thirds of the wood in a glue lamb beam or 30 to 50 odd percent of the concrete in a structural panel. Carbon fiber, as we heard, can profitably displace steel auto bodies. 
carbon fiber anti-corrosion wrap save the 30 or 40 percent of concrete that isn't needed for static strength is just to cover up the rebar so it won't rust. Well, of course, you can use carbon fiber rebar that doesn't rust and <laughs> save even more weight. Uh, and then there's the auto-resistant shell of the abalone, tougher than our best missile nose cone ceramics, but instead of being made in an incandescent furnace, it self-assembles it in four degrees Celsius seawater. Conch shell, by the way, is 10 times tougher still. It's a thousand times tougher than the chalky biomaterials it's made of. Besides bamboo rebar, whose growth fixes offsetting carbon, lower negative cost uh, or negative carbon substituents to dilute Portland cement range from otherwise wasted silica-rich rice hulls and silica fume to fly ash. By the way, the first of those examples is a carbon neutral cement that Taiheo has long sold in Japan, reinforced with bamboo. Some of the additives can markedly improve concrete's performance. The Freedom Tower in New York saved 40% of its cement through stronger concrete and snowballing weight savings. Uh, and now it's twice that good, more than twice, it's 10 times as strong as house concrete. Uh, and then putting a twist in the 128-story Shanghai Tower, the world's second tallest building, shrank the wind loads and the structural systems, so it saved $58 million on structural costs. China makes over half the world's cement. They used to make it in shaft kilns, which produced very irregular quality, so you had to use three times as much to make sure your structure wouldn't fall down, but that meant when you switch to a modern process, you save three times more fuel than you thought. And we found in China that making cement and rebar to European quality can make buildings last longer and can cut Chinese cement demand, which is over half the world's, six to 10%, Chinese steel demand six or 8%, global radar demand 13%. There are also a lot of indirect benefits to better building materials. Their lower quantity combines with lower manufacturing energy and decarbonized supply to save more coal. Less cement and steel and coal needs to be moved around. That frees up rail capacity that can help shift freight from road to rail. That cuts road damage. It saves cement and money to rebuild roads. Less cement means still less transport need and so on while freeing more rail capacity uh, re reduces rail build out and repair, that saves more steel and money, and these virtuous circles save more carbon and lower cost. Like abalone or conch shell, but even more flexible, sea urchin spines use a self-assembling mesocrystalline structure that can give calcium silicate hydrate 40 to 100 times the flexural strength, bending strength, of normal concrete. What can we do with flexible concrete or with analogous new cementitious chemistries or with biomimetic spider silk that can be re woven into cocoon-like rooms. And finally, the world's largest non-agricultural waste stream turns out to be construction and demolition waste. In Europe, it's about a half ton per person per year, but it's especially suited to recycling. The Dutch have come up with a smart crushing machine with a tenth the normal force that can selectively liberate the 40% or so unhydrated cement for valuable reuse in new concrete. And they say globally this might save up to two and a half gigatons of CO2 a year. Then there are new elastonite cements like Solidia that stick to themselves so you can patch a concrete road in, like asphalt instead of having to tear it out and start over. So these and many other diverse demand side options for using less cement, less steel and so on multiply to very large savings even before we get to circular economy and more benign products and efficient processes and fuel switching and renewables. So this efficient end use of materials multiplies back upstream to materials extraction and production. It leaves a lot less high temperature process heat to decarbonize. So basically, we're figuring out how to add the missing first eight lines, printed a little brighter here, uh, to the conventional 12-line opportunity space and make the problem a lot easier. I therefore don't think heavy transport uh, or process heat are uniquely hard to decarbonize. Of course, none of this stuff is easy, and some sub subsectors like cement do have unique institutional barriers, but I think the hard sectors, small number of major players and large combustion devices, 
their operators relentlessly competitive focus on the business case might even offer potential decarbonization advantages over the messier, fragmented market, multi-million target sectors like light duty vehicles and buildings. So maybe the main thing that makes heavy transport and process heat hard is the belief that they're hard. And I've given you a little gallery of examples suggesting that might be a losing bet. So we're excited to test that hypothesis as the next enlargement of industrial energy efficiencies uh, integrative design space. And if anything I've said today has surprised you, just remember that remark by Marshall McLuhan. He said, only puny secrets need protection. Big discoveries, he said, are protected by public incredulity. <laughs> Thank you for your good work and your kind attention. <laughs>